Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Family Church. I am glad you're here as we're working through the book of Mark, and we are in chapter 9, in case you're uh, wondering where I'm supposed to turn to. And let's begin and just evaluate our hearts and ask the question, uh, for everyone that's here listening right now, wherever you're hearing this from, you all live by faith. Some element of faith is is active in your life. And the question, of course, that I want to ask is, uh, what kind of faith do you have? What are you placing your faith in? For instance, some people put their faith in money, you know, the hope that that my retirement will be there when I get there, or the Social Security will carry me when I get to those years. For some of you, that's 40 years from now. And for others, you're like, that's next year. Will it be there? And will it be available? And you put faith that it will be, that you trust that it's going to be there. And as crazy it is, as it is, you put faith in other drivers every day. You, you come to stop signs and you're trusting, you're having faith that when you start, the next car coming will stop. You ever think about the going out in the morning? If you have a car and you go to start your car, by faith you think, okay, it's going to start. I don't even think about it. Boom. And then it doesn't. And faith in that starter begins to crumble. And sometimes you get the car repaired, and the first time you go to start it, I, you, maybe you go, is it really going to work? Is it really fixed? And then there's those of you who have a crazy faith. Um, I have watched, and I do not desire to participate in bungee jumping. But if that's something you've done, and you have faith that a rubber band coil inside some nylon rope is going to protect you from that dive, and then keep you from hitting whatever the ground is below... You have immense faith. And I will tell you, you can't convince me that I won't die if I do that. I have a great fear of bungee jumping. And and the reality is we're really talking about a human-sized faith. And human-sized faith often is built on what I observe. And then any time that that thing I observed fails, I can completely lose trust in it. And then I have to rebuild it. Um, But I want to talk today about Faith. But I'm going to talk about divine faith. This is a faith that is an incredible. So there's this word um, that, that means faith in the Greek. It's pistis. And this is a, a word that's the root of many other words. Um, faith is kind of the core concept. And out of that, we think of trust and confidence and belief. So there's lots of other words that are formed out of this very root word of Faith. And now, from the spiritual divine perspective, um, Hebrews defines faith for us. It says here that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So, the faith that God gives us, first, you must understand that this faith is divine faith. It's not a human, you can't conjure it up, you can't make yourself believe. This is a, an incredible gift that is from God only. And it's never able to be produced by people. It's a gift that God gives us. And look at the the definition here. Faith is the assurance. So this is a, a confidence that God Almighty is in control and that the things we hope for that he has promised us, that we can be confident that even though we don't see it, it will be provided. So our faith in Jesus gives us a hope for an eternity with Christ in heaven someday. We can't see it yet, but the Spirit of God gives us faith to believe it, to rest in it. And if you haven't made that leap of faith, if you don't have that conviction, and if you don't have that belief, the beautiful truth is that God would love to give that to you. But you have to ask. And so we want to go into the story with a little bit of an understanding that faith is an incredible, wonderful gift from God. In our story today, we're going to see how someone's belief is really challenged as Jesus is going to again show up and prove once again that he has authority and power over all things. And so I want to remind you before we get into the passage where we left off last week, uh, Pastor Jason talked through this incredible moment where Jesus and James and Peter and John were up on the mountaintop and there was the transfiguration. This was the, the revealing of the glory of God, which is Jesus in the flesh. And he reveals that glory to them. What a powerful moment. And of course, it says that after this moment, you know, all that's left is Jesus and they come down the mountain and Jesus is once again conveying that the Messiah 
had to come, had to be uh, tormented, tortured, ultimately killed by those in the community, and ultimately then beyond that to rise defeating death and sin and giving evidence and proof that he is the one who can give us eternal life and forgiveness of sins. I mean, an incredible mountaintop experience with a pretty dreary walk down the hill. And so that kind of sets up. They're, they're just coming to the base of the mountain. They're coming into town. And that's where we pick up in the story today. So if you want to go ahead and follow along, Mark chapter 9, verse 14 says this. And when they came to the disciples, so this is Jesus and Peter and James and John. When they came to the disciples who were in town, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. Boy, you left the mountaintop of joy and you're coming into the chaos. There's the scribes, religious leaders who are arguing with the disciples. And immediately, verse 15, the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. So here's the crowd. There's something going on. There's an argument going between these disciples and some local Jewish leaders, the scribes. And the crowd comes around. It says that they were amazed and ran up to him. And there's a lot of uh, thoughts about what this amazed word means. But the root of it really means there's a, a sense of fear and also surprise. And so I was thinking about from a couple perspectives. One, it doesn't say this, but maybe they were like, oh, we are amazed. What timing. What a coincidence. Here we have an argument happening. There's something going on in town. We're going to find out in just a moment what that is. And wouldn't you know it? Jesus, the great rabbi, shows up. They're amazed. What timing. Have you ever lived your life in that way? Boy, what a, what a coincidence. And when you realize this is a divine intervention, so maybe they were amazed by that, or maybe they were amazed because the disciples are arguing with the, uh, the scribes, and maybe, maybe people are thinking, oh man, he's in trouble now. The rabbi's back. I don't know what they were amazed by, but they were amazed that it's Jesus. They come and they greet him, it says in verse 16, and he asked them, speaking to the disciples, what are you arguing about with them? So Jesus now, returning to his disciples, the crowds gathered, but he addresses the disciples. What are you arguing about with them? What's going on? And you got to love what happens. The disciples, I imagine, are just about to burst out some kind of excuse or explanation. And it says here in verse 17, and someone from the crowd answered him. The disciples are like, we don't have to answer. Someone else chimes up. He says, teacher, I brought my son to you. For he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And so I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able to. Wow. Here's dad. This is dad with a son and he's concerned about his son. His son is not well. There's, there's clearly a spirit that's causing some very difficult issues with his, the way his body is behaving. And in a broken, maybe last resort move, he says, I came looking for you and what I found were your disciples. And uh, I'd heard stories, maybe he could say, I've heard about who you are. I've even heard about these disciples. But it says they weren't able to do this. They weren't able to help my son. What a heartbreak that must be. Can you imagine just being in this moment? You, you came with hope. You came with, you know, maybe this is the last resort. Maybe you've tried local doctors. Maybe you've tried the local magicians or sorcerers. Maybe you've prayed. Maybe. And so you come to the place where you think, okay, this is it. I don't know where else to go, but I've heard about Jesus. And one, he's not there. And two, the people that knew him couldn't do what you thought could be done. And just think about the disappointment. And in this moment, we get to see how Jesus responds. And I love when you just take time to slow down and look at how Jesus interacts. Because I've read this passage many times, and every time I prepare to study and I slow down, it's amazing how much gets revealed. And so I want to just kind of hat tip to the teaching team that really helped me out this week, because I was, I was struggling to get ready. 
And so for Shauna Murphy and Heather Jones, for Drew who was there that weekend, and for Jeremy, I just want to say thank you for the help because a lot of this comes as we kind of united together and looked at God's word and, and how cool it is to watch Jesus' response. And so it says after he explains that he tried, the disciples failed, it didn't work, here's what happens. And Jesus answered them, O foolish generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Just think about that moment. Now, I don't know if he's only speaking specifically to his disciples who were unable, or if he's broadcasting that to the Jewish leaders and the community around. But I want you to look at the heart of Jesus. When I read it, my first attempt, often I read scripture through an angry Jesus. Oh man, what a bunch of idiots. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what's happening? But I think what he's just pressing in, he's like, my time is drawing near. Like, I've been here. I've been doing ministry, and we just came down from the mountain. Of course, he's not explaining this because he told the disciples, keep it quiet for now. But think in his mind, I just transfigured. I just revealed God's glory, and now I'm back with you. How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? And then his response, bring him to me. That's a great way in which you and I should also interact. Instead of stepping in to try to fix things for people, we should just bring them to Jesus and begin to introduce them to the one who truly has all authority. But he says, bring him to me in verse 20. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy and he fell on the ground and, it ro- and he rolled about. He's foaming at the mouth. And then verse 21 And Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? How long has this been happening to him? When I first read this, I didn't understand why Jesus asked this question. But when you go back and you look at the culture of the day, oftentimes when somebody was ill, Uh, We see stories of a blind person and and the scribes would often ask, who sinned, your mother or your father? There was an expectation that somebody in your history did something wrong and you're bearing the weight of their sin. But I want you to look again at Jesus' response. He He doesn't go to the father and say, so what did you do for your son to be like this? Instead, he looks at him and he invites him into conversation. Tell me about this. How long has this been happening to him? Like that's the heart of our Savior, a heart of compassion, a heart of desire to know you and an opportunity to say, I see you, I know who you are, and I know what your needs are. So how long has this been happening to him? And of course, the father replies from childhood, and it's often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can do anything, Jesus, have compassion on us and help us. So his son has been riling now. He's in the middle of convulsing. There's a conversation. This spirit that is tormenting his son is acting out. Jesus is on the scene. It sees Jesus. The the dad's talking to Jesus. He says, this has been happening since childhood, but you know what? If you can do anything of all the things, Jesus, would you have compassion and would you help us? And man, Jesus, I'm sure, is looking at him saying, oh, I can't wait to show you. I can't wait to help you. And look at the response, verse 23. And Jesus said to him, if you can... All things are possible for one who believes. And this is such an incredible statement. We're going to come back to it in a little bit, but just catch what he said. If you can, like, do you truly believe who I am? Do you know who I am? If you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And this this statement has been used to create some real problems, I think. It's been misused. And so, We'll address this in a moment, but look at Jesus' response and look what happens in verse 24. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. 
Like, I believe who you are, Jesus, but will you actually do what I've heard you can do? I have some, some belief that you have power to do this. I've heard stories. I've, I've even heard from your disciples what, what could have happened but I'm not sure that you'll really help us. Will you have compassion? And will you help us? If you can do anything, would you help us? Verse 25, And when Jesus saw that a crowd had come running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit and saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Wow. I've never seen Jesus uh, speak to a demon this way or a spirit this way. But he he commands him to not come back ever again either. And I'm not entirely sure why that's unique to this one, but, but he makes it clear, you're done here, I'm in control. And now you're the father. And now your son is convulsing, crying out, verse 26, And terribly, it says it came out of the boy and he was like a corpse so that most of them said, he's dead. Uh, Can you be the father for a moment watching this moment? You, You came to the disciples and it didn't work. Your son was still convulsing. You came and Jesus was there. And Jesus asked you questions and he said, it's possible, all things are possible. And he begins to speak to the spirit and the spirit causes the son yet again to convulse. And it says it was convulsing him terribly. So dad is, I'm sure, holding his son or not sure what to do. And then all of a sudden he lay like a corpse. Oh no, what did I do? Could you imagine for this moment? This is probably the the longest time in history for somebody. The moment that the, the crowd says he's dead and the response that's coming from Jesus. But here it is, don't lose the moment. As a dad, what did I do? What I thought was the last resort ended up being the end of the road. Oh, the brokenheartedness. My son's dead. It looks like it. Everybody said it. I thought Jesus had power. I thought he was the one. I I put my trust in Jesus and look what happened. I didn't get the response that I desired. Look what happened. I'd have been better off to have never come because my son would still be alive. And look at him. There he is. Everybody can see I'm embarrassed. I feel shame. I thought Jesus was going to do what I asked. But I think this is the moment, if you can think back to the father's plea to Jesus. He says, I believe, but help my unbelief. And Jesus is now going to complete what he said he would do to him. He's going to finish the task. But in this moment, this is the moment for you and me. This is the moment where we step out in faith with an expectation of Jesus to show up and do something, something miraculous, something incredible. And the response time between what you asked and what you received doesn't seem to match up. Some of you are still waiting for that miracle, for that answer. Some of you are still waiting. And some, the answer came too quickly. But Jesus was there the whole time. He never left. Just like in her story, Jesus is there. The boy may be laying. He may look like a corpse. People may be pronouncing his dead, but Jesus is there. And now he's going to help the unbelief. Look what he does. Verse 27. And Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. How do you think the father's belief meter went? Do you think it might have grown a little bit there? Do you think some faith might have been imparted? But see, there's something incredible about this story Notice, if you would, if you could remember a few minutes ago, Jesus addressed the heart before he fixed the problem. The man's belief in him was the problem. That's the deepest need. 
Remember the, the opening statement in the book of Mark. Jesus says, I have come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's Jesus' call for you and me and for this moment. And so before he goes to heal the son, he looks at the dad and says, all things are possible for those who believe. See, your heart matters more than even this problem because I have an eternal solution. Yours is a temporary request. But Jesus takes him by the hand, lifts him up, and the boy gets up. And can you imagine? I wish I knew the story of the father and son. What was their response beyond that? Did they devote their lives to Jesus following him after that? I'm going to be convinced that they probably did. That's a pretty miraculous moment for them. And Jesus used that to develop and deepen their faith, their belief in him. And I believe they, he also used that for those around in the crowd. And verse 28 says, and they, they had entered the house. So they left this scene. They went back to a house. And his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. We're going to come back to that. But I want to start here with a few points. First of all, belief matters. Belief matters. Jesus is calling the father to a state of belief. And the father admits, look, I have some belief, but you're going to have to help my unbelief. Remember that description of faith, a gift from God, nothing that you can manifest in yourself by your own power. You can't produce faith. And he's asking, God, I believe, but give me faith to believe more. Belief matters. This is a big deal. This is belief in this core is the desire to trust God. And then God uses that to give you faith to help you believe to trust God. This, this continual perpetual movement. And I don't know about you, but my belief or my faith, it can be really strong some days and it can be a little bit weak as well. I, it's kind of this back and forth like a slinky moving all the time. I wake up in the morning, there's a reminder every day. That's the first question. How's my faith right now? Sometimes I wake up and, man, I'm, I'm convinced that God is in control and let's go for the day. And some days I'm not. Some days I'm a little softer on that and I need a little bit of response time with God, a little communion with God to remind me that he is in control. So if your, your faith can be heavy, it can be, it can be strong, it can be weak, um, it's not perfect, it's not pure, it's not weak, it's not strong, it's always in flux, but it can always be increasing if we'll trust, if we'll surrender, if we'll believe. And all we have to do is say, God, help in my unbelief right now. I know who you are. I know what you can do. But help my unbelief. Help in the areas where I am struggling to trust that what you have is best. Let's look at that passage for a moment when Jesus spoke to them and he said, if you can, remember the response to the man who says, look, if you can do anything. And Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. The challenge for me of this passage is the way I've seen it misused and abused. First of all, it does not say that all things are guaranteed for the one who believes. Not all things are guaranteed. Your, every request you present does not mean you get to rub the genie lamp. You might remember a few months ago I taught on that idea. You don't get to rub the genie lamp and say, here's what I want, and you expect you get exactly what you want because the balancing act said all things are possible. Not all things are guaranteed. But there are some guarantees. The guarantee is that for the one who believes in Jesus, because of the work he did as he came and he lived the perfect life and died a horrible death, replacing you and me on what we deserve, took taking our sin, taking the wrath of God upon himself, dying and then rising again, defeating death and sin. He says, I promise you this. If you believe in me, I will give you some promises, some guarantees. Guarantee number one, you will be released from the penalty of the sin. You will not be held accountable to the penalty of sin that you deserve. I took it for you. So you could implant in this, all things are guaranteed for those who believe. Here's the things that are guaranteed though. Not, <laughs> these things are guaranteed. I should rephrase that. These things are guaranteed for the one who believes. One, the penalty of sin is no longer going to be in your account. Clean. 
paid in full. Second, the power of sin over you. The Holy Spirit will indwell you and help you to overcome the temptation and the sin that so easily entangles you. Guaranteed. If you will work with God, if you will trust in the Spirit, if you will let your faith be fueled by God's power, he will begin to release you from those things if that's your desire and his will to guide you. And third, the presence of sin in eternity will no longer be affecting you or a part of your world. Heaven will be a place where all things are made new, all things are right. Sin is no longer evident. Only pure, holy love and adoration with the Father. But what I've heard on this passage, all things are possible for the one who believes, is sometimes people get abused by this statement. Clearly, this didn't happen. This illness didn't get cured. This need didn't get met. These finances didn't come in because you don't have enough belief or you didn't pray hard enough. And I just want to help you understand something. There is a temptation to try to manipulate God for our will and completely ignore the will of the Father. That is my temptation. God, here's what I want. I think it's what's best. In fact, I'm confident. Would you please do this? And God, in his incredible wisdom, sometimes he says, this is good. And oftentimes he says, wait. And then he also says, no. I know what you desire, but you're not seeing the bigger picture. You've only got a few puzzle pieces and I have the whole picture. So will you have faith? See, our greatest need is belief in Jesus. And it supersedes all of our physical needs. Faith in Christ is the only way to life for eternity with a beautiful Father who loves us so much. I want to close with one last thought and really comes down to the closing part of the passage that dependence on God is required. We we have got to learn to be dependent on God. And let's remind ourselves of the story of what was going on. See, the, the disciples, those who weren't with Jesus on the hill, it appears they were trying to heal this boy. And the scribes were there and they were arguing. And I'm guessing they're arguing about why it did or did not happen. And here's this this moment. It says, remember, Jesus took them, uh, verse 28, when Jesus had entered the house, his disciple asked him privately, why couldn't we cast it out, Jesus? What did we do wrong? And he directs them back to yours and mine and their innate and most important need. He says, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Now, we don't have a lot of clarity of what they're arguing about, and we don't have clarity of their intentions, but I can't help but think that these are the disciples who a few chapters back we taught on. Jesus sent them out and gave them authority to cast out demons, gave them authority to heal people. And my guess is that like you and me, the disciples began to think they could operate in their own strength. Like, I've done it before, I'll just... Repeat it and do it again. And Jesus, I think, draws them right back. But you didn't go to the source. See, prayer is about a relationship with the living God, a a relationship that says, I want to hear you and do you hear me? This back and forth, I know you're listening. God, I love you. Do you you hear me? And of course, the Father says, of course I hear you. I'm, I'm with you. And prayer is this, Communion, this daily commitment to trusting God in prayer, talking with the Father, the the daily commitment to walking with God in all situations, at work, at play, in my home, wherever I go. A daily commitment to surrender to God, to his will, not my will, not my desires. It's a daily surrender, a daily and continual talking with God and listening to God. My guess is that what happened was, as Jesus is confronting the disciples, he's saying, you tried to do this in your energy. You expected the outcomes from the past without approaching the only one who has the power and authority to do what you're asking. 
And so dependence on God is incredibly important. It is essential to walk with God daily. That's why the blessed rhythm we've talked about, that, that's why beginning in prayer is so essential. If I think I'm going to go into my day and have success proclaiming the gospel apart from the power of God, I am fooling myself. I, I have to get back to the Father. And that's why we felt it was important to begin this 30 days of prayer here in August, to just pray together, to seek the Father, to learn that every day and all day is what he's asking for, not as a command of some kind of you have to, but as a loving father saying, I want to. Would you spend time with me all day? Would you not compartmentalize me to Sunday? Could I be a part of all your week from the moment you rise to the moment you go to sleep and in between? It's an invitation. And Jesus points it out. He says, look, you missed the main part. You missed that all of this was done because of the power of God. And it's very likely that they began to try to do it in their own energy, in their own strength. So for you and me, it's a reminder every day, in every way, everywhere we go, that we would rely on Jesus, that we would seek the power of God, that we would have communion with the Father, that we would be united in spirit. And then as we're working together, as we're praying, as we're getting the heart of God, we will begin to see God fulfill the very things that I'm praying for because I'm praying his will. I'm learning to pray what God wants. And when I'm praying what God wants, all things truly are possible for the one who believes. I love you guys. I'm going to release to the campuses. Have a great rest of your day. And if you've Managed to stick it through to the end. I want to say thanks so much. And I, I want to just leave you with this idea. It's very simple. But I think it's a daily exercise. I believe. Help my unbelief. I want to remind you that belief in the gospel is a daily reminder. There's no such thing as when I was 12 years old, I said yes to Jesus and I don't have to say yes anymore. This is a a daily belief, a daily reminder, a daily encounter with God. And I'll tell you, there are always going to be new trials and new temptations and new opportunities for your faith or your belief to be tested. But the beauty of God is he says, look, if you will come to me, I will help you in your unbelief. So if there's something that you're not sure about today, if if you're not sure you can trust Jesus as your Savior, I want to encourage you to ask. Say, God, I, I believe you're real, but Jesus, I'm not sure I believe that you're who you say you are. And if you would ask with sincerity, I believe that he will reveal that to you. And if you're struggling with something, whether it's finances or a health issue, just something in your world where you're walking in the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe you're just walking in a a dark season or maybe you're on the mountaintop experience. I just want to remind you, Jesus is with you and he says, I want to help you. Just ask. Because my goal is to deepen your faith, to deepen your trust in me. And the cool thing about deepening is over time, we can trust that Jesus is who he says he is because every time we walk through a situation where it's difficult or challenging, we can look back and go, look at what Jesus did. I love you guys. I hope you have a great rest of your week and I look forward to seeing you in the weeks to come. Love you guys. Bye.